Thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. I am Mustafa Sharif, an urban planner, and you're more than welcome to join my big journey of exploring the making of smarter and more livable cities. Please don't forget to follow Urbanistica on the different social media platforms and also let's connect on LinkedIn. Big thanks to Urbanistica podcast partner, AFRI. AFRI is an international engineering and design company providing sustainable solutions in the fields of energy, industry, and infrastructure. Are you ready for a new episode? Let's go for it. I have the pleasure to welcome you, Rawat, to Urbanistica podcast. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi, Mustafa. Hi, everyone. How are you doing, Rawat? Good. All good. Thank you. Yeah. Where and where where are you now in, in which city? Yeah, I'm close to Parma. I'm not at the office today. Our office is in Milan. Yeah. It's a good time, so we try to work half half. So here yeah, I am. Yeah. How is, how is the weather, by the way, in Italy? Now it's summer, right? Today is wonderful. Yeah. Today is wonderful because it's cloudy. Yes, it's <laughs> <a little> hot. <laughs> yeah. But it's typically hot as well. Mm, yeah. This mm. year is not very hot. So. You also have it like uh, because here in Sweden, before the everyone goes to the summer vacation, we have a lot of deadlines. Everyone needs to send in the reports, drawings, and uh, everything. Is it the same in Italy? Yeah, yeah. August is typically the um, let's say the um, the festivities and vacations month. Yeah. So everyone wants to close out, but yeah. our work basically is uh, everywhere worldwide. So mm. we have to adapt to yeah. to last to rush on on every festivity. So mm. today is uh, is Eid, I think, in the yeah. Arab world. So we have to have we had a rush. We're going to have another rush in July, and then we have rush in September. <laughs> so. It goes forever. Yes, yes. So, Rawad, you are our storyteller. Let's start with you. How would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Well, I'm an architect, urban planner. I've been working in the me in the field of transportation planning and mobility engineering for the past 20 years, uh, most of which I spent at Systematica. Today, I'm a uh, I'm a technical director and uh, member of the of the boards, whether of Systematica or Transfer Transport. Foundation. So uh, yeah, that I'm uh, I'm working as uh, I'm working a number of projects in Europe, in the Middle East, everywhere, and doing following up a number of research projects as well. Yeah, and what what is like a technical director? If you can elaborate on this. Yeah, it's it's something more related to uh, to the European market. It's mm-hmm. uh, someone who's responsible for. The technical correctness of everything that's going out of the company. So mm. there is a final supervisor yeah. that's making sure we're making sure that uh, that whatever we say, all, all our calculations, advice, consultancy, is hinged on on science and hinged on objective findings. So yeah, that's yeah. It. that's my role. But does it mean you, that you need to be in every project, like to check every project before they submit it? Well, technically, yes. Uh, practically, no. <laughs> so it's almost impossible when you have to. Well, there is a lot of trust in our company. Yeah. We, our, my colleagues and and my senior figures are are trustworthy. They are excellent professionals. I trust what they're doing. My input is more on advising, trying to improve the product, trying to to put some doubts, questions, some some principles, yeah. but not really checking. I'm not a. You know, I mean. We're not at school. We're just all a group of professionals and we're working together. But yeah, ultimately, if there's anything to sign, the technical director should be taking the final liability of that product. Yeah, very interesting. And and uh, we have many projects to talk about. And in this episode, we're going to focus on uh, Step Up Walkability for Women in Milan. But before that, I'd love to hear more about the TT, Transform Transport. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to pronounce it. To pronounce, it. <laughs> we're struggling with that, so we call it FTT, which is FTT Fondazione Transform Transport. Yeah. Well, Transform Transport was started as a name of uh, of our brochure, which we uh, started a few years ago as Systematica. We never produced an online brochure. We 
we produced some sort of a book where we told our, we'd like to tell about stories. Yeah. We told our, about our projects. So every project was was transformed into into a small, um, I mean, a couple of pages. Yeah. And and that was the transfer transfer. And then uh, Systematica, since a long time, has not only been doing consultancy, it's always been indulged and involved in, uh, in a lot of research projects. So it came to a point where we wanted to transform all these research efforts and endeavors into something a bit more solid. So mm-hmm. we founded the FTT a few years ago. Yeah. And FTT has the chance, being a nonprofit organization, to look into topics that ordinary private consultancy does not give you the chance to, mm. to do, especially when we talk about uh, environmental, social inclusion, gender all those issues that might be left a bit aside when you probably talk to private developers or to architectural firms working for private entities. Mm. So we wanted uh, to to establish uh, this entity. And there's another side of it, which this entity also feeds back into consultancy. So we got to a point where we needed some fresh ideas. We needed needed a, a group of people to be investing time only in research with no specific purpose. So this is how FTT the whole idea started and we 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 founded this in uh, a few years ago so, yeah yeah, yeah. but so this is more like a, a research institute a kind of right found or research foundation foundation yeah, yes exactly yeah. Yeah. and and uh, if i understand you correctly when you have a foundation you have more possibilities for like a fund research like financially also is it correct yes exactly it it, it gives you the chance to access uh, some grants that you might not be able to access as a private company, mm. and, and it's a non-profit. So the, the economy of that foundation is very much different from the consultancy. Yeah, it's not working to make profit. It's working to to increase the number of researchers working mm. and to increase the content that we produce every day. So this is the ultimate goal. And uh, yeah, but ideally, uh, if we, if we talk about in terms of uh, calls or tenders, we have we have the possibility to to access some tenders we also have a a different position when when just when talking to the public administration we're mm. not looked at as a private but not looked as a research foundation uh, which is true yeah so that's another that's uh, good positive point yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, and and the team in 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 the ftt the same people in the studio or no different researchers well um we have some people that who are totally dedicated to okay. ftt mm. Have some people whom we are sharing, yeah. have have yeah, between yeah. consultancy and research, and this is all in the making because ultimately, when FTT starts to uh, when it takes off, it starts having its own projects, its own economy. The idea is to start having a full staff which is dedicated to FTT. Yeah. So we're still at the beginning, and we're hoping that this won't be uh, uh, the case in the future. Although we're very happy about also this format because. In a way, whoever is working on a consultancy project is also bringing some of the knowledge yeah. from research. Mm. So, so we're more and more a content company where we try to produce content. We use that content back into the market. Mm. Otherwise, it remains there in the academic world. So that's something we're trying really to avoid. Yeah, yeah. And usually, like to apply for the funds, uh, is it easy now? Is it like? Because uh, here in Sweden, we are doing the same, like from the company I work with the studio, it's like more consultant as well. Sometimes it's difficult because you need to have a lot of partners in order to, to apply for the fund, uh, for the like a Swedish one. Then there's the European, which is like more complicated. Uh, how is it for you? Like, you, are you aiming for more like uh, in e- Italian on the national level or no, you even apply for like a, a European one? Yeah, we've been working more on on European level. Mm. Now, step up that we're going to talk about is much on an Italian level. Yeah. Uh, although the team is not purely Italian, the team is um, is from everywhere, and uh, yeah. But uh, the partnering with other institutes or with other companies, whether private or mm. public or, or institutes or foundations, is key to the success of these research projects because. Yeah. At no time you're going to have all the expertise in house. You can't have it into one big company. So you need those uh, yeah. niche type of uh, thinkers who can bring into their technology, into their uh, their know how mm-hmm. and and thoughts and ideas. So the idea of of research is really it stems from that concept of 
of being multidisciplinary, multifaceted, and yeah, so it's, it's really at the at the essence. But uh, uh, I mean, yeah, accessing those standards, whether it's foundation or it's a uh, systematic mm. as a as a private uh, private company, it's um, it's it's more or less the same process. Yeah. Great. So let's uh, talk about step up. Uh, okay. I, I want uh, you to tell me about the background of formulating this project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So step up is um, is is a is a project. We called it step up, by the way. It was a an ordinary call that was developed that was um, published by Fundazione Carlo. We we joined that project and we we got awarded. So it was wow. one of the first projects we do with uh, Fundazione Carlo. It's one of the biggest foundations doing research in Italy today. Mm -hmm. So the project is is about women, and uh, the reason why we we participated and we felt strong about it is because we've done another big project uh, in the world of gender, which is called uh, Diamond. Mm -hmm. It was funded by the EU, and we've done this in the past. Uh, Two years, it was over last year. So, so we're very fresh in terms of coming from a mm. from the background of looking at gender from a different perspective. Now, yeah. step up, it has a it has a very interesting um, objective. Now, at the end of the day, we're looking at uh, at walkability for women. We want to make walkability in cities more pleasant, mm. more safe. We want to. Um, I mean, I'm going to talk about more about this, but in in simple terms. Uh, the, the 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 objective is to to not not to speculate about the relationship between gender and physical space. These okay. two things are so much correlated, mm -hmm. much more than we can expect. Mm -hmm. and the only way to unveil that is really to look into data and to talk to people suffering from from that sense from that conception of of insecurity. So this is where where it all started from. Yeah. And how how is this situation on the ground for for walkability uh, for women, if you describe? Yeah, well, yeah. The uh, the, the European Institute um, of of uh, of gender in general is 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 collecting a lot of data, and this data is showing that the perception of women of uh, of the public space in cities is still uh, is still a place of insecurity, yeah. especially in specific times of the day. So if you look at how how women today they tackle this, they tackle it from every point of view. So a woman can can first of all decide not to travel because of that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, she can uh, decide to travel accompanied, so she's in a way conditioned. Um, she might change her travel mode. Mm -hmm. She can change her uh the way uh the the, the, the route of uh, the, the the route she takes to yeah. to get some so all this in fact this makes uh, makes uh women being conditioned to to specific um i mean yeah they're conditioned they don't have the freedom to use the city the way a man let's say can mm. can use it mm. so this is where it all stems from the the the, the, the european institute i was mentioning has shown statistics especially in italy the perception of 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 public space as as a safe place to mm. walk especially in 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 when it's when it's nighttime in Italy is one of the worst in Europe and okay. uh, where it starts um, so so yeah and here we're talking about pure perception you no know? we're not talking about uh, crime rates or mm. we're just talking about perception based on focus groups questionnaires. But this is the result that people, uh, that women in Italy, yeah. feel much insecure compared to men. Mm -hmm. Do we do we know like about the more like the actual accidents or no? There there are not so many data. Well, there is data. The mm. data is uh, is not uh, totally disclosed in, in a. I mean, we in a way when we look at data, we are not interested in the specific case. No, yeah. we're looking at big numbers. We're looking just like like big data. Mm. When 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 you when you think about privacy issues and big data, we don't we don't want to know about the the specificities. We want mm. to look at numbers. Yeah. We want to look at where those numbers are located within the city mm. and then try to go into those specific areas and understand what is really the correlation. Mm. How, how can we as designers, as urban planners yeah. and transportation engineers, rethink some of our 
precepts and try to change the way we mm. we design the cities. Exactly. And the, the different aspect you mentioned from the survey of perception survey, um, they feel and believe like this because of like, do they say, okay, because we we were evident, like there were evidence that we saw maybe like a crime in the street, so we avoid or we change our route. So what are like uh, the elements behind these, this perception? Yeah, well, this is the the, 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 the big subject here. Mm. So this is what we're trying to, to investigate yeah. is what are the elements, because there are lots of easy elements that would be like light uh, surveillance cameras. And these are the, the these are the, the obvious like, like, quick wins, yeah. right? Well, but but there's something that's happening also on on a city level as an ecosystem and, and on a neighborhood level. Mm. This relates to everything. It relates to 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 renting prices. It can relate to uh, to the proximity to public transportation. It mm. can relate to the block size, uh, the the treatment of the of the facades, the treatment of the edges of your plot. Do you have the, the presence of trees, the presence of cars, the lots of, of details that, that come into, into place. Mm. But before getting to that, what we're looking at is at the higher level from a statistical point of view, getting yeah. all the lighting data, the crime data, the harassment data, mm. everything that goes with it. We'd like to, uh, to focus on specific points. And um, what we're trying to, to avoid, because we have 12 months of work, we don't have an infinite amount of time. Okay, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so we have these 12 months and we're being very selective. So even if when we do the focus groups and questionnaires, we're yeah. trying to, to go to specific areas, mm. walk together with people, take some some observations from them and, and try to, to focus on specific areas. We're trying to find the commonalities in observations, mm. what are the common traits, what are the recurrent observations and we're always looking at something which is not really what you would expect yeah because yeah. i think that's that's the fun part now we're still at the early part of this process okay so i can't I can say we've got the results mm. but we have uh, we have worked on the on the, i mean we have pre-configured the way we're going to work to start from literature review then go to um to, to collect data and I'm going to talk about more about data. Um, data we're getting it from geoportals. We're getting yeah. it from open source data. So the municipality is also being part of this. But also we have an application which is called Where, and that application is an application for women. So women report their sense of security on that application. So we have, a, and every time you report, yeah. the point where you reported is there. So what? How? What does it mean? It means. Uh, I'm I'm walking there in in uh, Via Lovagno, and I say, "Watch out, girls! It's not a safe place." Ah, you send the you, signal. You send the signal. So so next time, you, you, someone would be might be avoiding that. Well, it's a trap as well. It's a capture yeah. mechanism because at the same time you're going to tag some areas yeah. as bad. So yes. Yeah. So so the app is today is helpful to to detect something. Yes. But we know it's not going to be a remedy. Mm. It's not going to be solving the problem on the longer term. So we are trying to start from that application mm -hmm. and also not only get data, but also reflect on how the application can be improved so that it we won't fall in the trap of of tagging specific streets mm. as bad streets and good streets. No? So, so uh, yeah. But, but again, going back, data is coming from these two sources. Yeah. Then we're putting that data, we're trying to understand why what's going what's happening there mm -hmm. understand what's happening there then we define those areas we go and we carry a number of questionnaires and we carry focus groups focus groups are just talking to people walking around that mm -hmm. zone telling stories and and getting um yeah and and then by the end of the 12 month period we should have some conclusions and some recommendations yeah. which help us to to be very specific in 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 changing specific parts mm -hmm. of the city in touching on guidelines of how to design cities and yeah. by the way we're working only in milan mm. so we're, very, we're being very specific we're not we're avoiding again to generalize because this is a very mm. tough topic yeah you can sleep easy yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i uh, mm, grateful that you explained to us the methodology because i i think it's 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 very important to, for us to understand like how do you how is it, like the journey from the formulating the research question until you deliver the the result or the solution but take me back to the application is it made 
by the project or no, there is an existing application? It is, uh, well, something I did not specify is just let me just mention that yeah. the members yeah. of this. So we're working, uh, first of all, with Walk21 Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's based in the UK. And today, Walk21 is the owner of this application. Yes. The application was was developed uh, elsewhere today, however, is, is the property of uh, Walk21. Mm. Um, then we're working with the University of Naples, Federico Secondo, and the Tema Lab. And uh, again, Federico Secondo, the University of Naples, they've been investing a lot of uh, research on, on gender issues. Mm. Then we're working with Sex and the City, which is another entity which is very operative in Milan okay. with the municipality. And they're mainly into, um, into community outreach, into engagement with people. Yeah. So they're covering that part of the story. And then we have Transform Transport, which is leading the, the consortium. Uh, we are much more on the cutting edge of data-driven and uh, data-driven uh, approach and, and analyzing mm. uh, data through through GIS platforms and on correlating data and trying to understand what I was mentioning before. Yeah. So, so this is to where today is the property of one of the participants of mm. this project. The the where the the where application started through the efforts of uh, someone else, Yonora and. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the current status. Yeah, so let's say I'm a woman, I have the uh, the phone, and if I, I feel like unsecure in a specific place, I take up my phone and I like to report this area or say, okay, this is, I didn't feel good here or safe here. And then, so it's create a kind of map with different dots, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely, and 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 it's it's not just black and white. It, there are lots of options within the app to mm. to report sensations. No, okay. to report. So it doesn't have to be paradise or hell. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it can be somewhere in between. Yeah, it, yeah, and and we're working on those on those intricacies, on those details, yeah. on those, uh, what is being reported back on on that application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And 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 this uh, because I work with the same methodology, like uh, pointing areas, but from children perspective. And then in the end, we have like a map of an area with the uh, green and and red, you know, like to avoid to go to. Um, but I imagine like if a lot of reports to this application, then you end up with having this map also somehow. Like then, like women will avoid this area completely, kind of. Yeah, that's the that's 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 the trap. So, yeah, uh, yeah. But we have to start somewhere. You know? Yeah, we don't exactly, have to write exactly. This. Yeah, the same is so we have to to look into it and to hope that this spread at some point will turn into green. Oh yeah, and uh, and perhaps when you you know it if uh, if you have a, a red there and you pass then again then you see why they're they're showing red here. Mm -hmm. Then notice that things change because perhaps there was some efforts to improve that space yeah. efforts to reactivate the public mm. realm and so on so you would you would start changing the rating of that place but so far when we we are aware of the mm. let's say of the, of the risk that mm. this might cause yeah at the same time we don't want to hide behind evidence no of course just, no yeah. you have you have to map the reality also like in order to change it exactly yeah so you you put together the data and uh, then based on that, you start with like a recommendation. Are you going to, to do like a design also proposals or no? Uh, we're not going to that uh, extent, yeah. but we would like to, uh, the reason why we're working also with the municipality, knowing that they're setting lots of guidelines mm. on how to reclaim public space, how to, uh, I mean, regarding tactical urbanism in general. Uh, so how to, to, to work in a, uh, through uh, through an acupuncture type of approach, where mm -hmm. you're going to to inject here and there, uh, th this would this would be something really nice to do. Yeah, we're going to stay much more on a on a policy guideline yeah. level, so it's going to be more on the on the general level. We'd like to take this project to another step, but we also have to be aware of the time we're given and the funds we have. Yeah, for coming this out, so it would be really good. That would this would turn into something uh, mm. uh, more developed in the future. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, but but to, to say in twelve months we're going all the way to design might be a, a stretch. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but this would be the ultimate goal. Otherwise, 
otherwise uh, yeah and then uh, i mean we are planners and designers so yeah. we're our focus today is more on the planning component mm. in, terms of, uh, in terms of everything yeah mixed use, you know uh, what happens to to, to dormitory areas where they are dominated by by just residential land use, how we can inject more life in that, mm. especially when they are peripheral, especially when they're less less funding into maintaining their infrastructure. Uh. And so that's something that's going to also shed light a bit on equality and inclusion in cities. So so starting from gender, you you open up just uh, the Pandora box and, and you start seeing that everything is making part of one system. Makes sense, yeah. And, and uh, you did the observation and you walk with the m- women, right? Yeah. What are the stories like? How do they experience um, areas? Yeah, well, that's something to be honest. I'm not. I'm not carrying out myself. Yeah. Um, this is something that uh, Sex and the City are uh, are carrying out. Yeah. During discussions, we've been. We've been, I mean, we look at the questionnaires. We look at the the focus groups, and and we know that. Uh, I mean, just some of the things I've read. Again, I don't want to claim to be the the expert on field. Uh, sometimes women have to change the way they dress. Mm. Uh, they have to they have to adapt to every hour of the day. They might be dressing differently from a peak hour compared to an off peak hour. If wow. they are taking the metro or they're taking any any uh, any congested mm. area. Mm. So um, I think the, the our focus is really how much women are conditioned today, and to what are they conditioned. If you look at the main characteristics or the main tactics that women use today they're really about time space uh so where they mm. how they walk, uh the mode of transportation the congestion level the comfort level uh, so in, in a way you can notice that there are mitigation strategies to to overcome that fear mm. is so much related to transportation whether it's space whether it's at the time of the day mm. whether it's the mode so you know uh, I think this is these are the uh, these are the, the the findings that we're getting uh, to out of talking to people. So we're so much focusing on what they are looking at, what are the influential factors, so mm. to speak, and how they're reacting to those. So these two two parts of the story are being uh, being fed mainly from the opinions of people. Yeah. And and as designers, we work a lot with the with the hardware of the city, like material and design and so on, built environment. And then you know there is the software, the people, and the culture and so on. But how can we like as a designer designers affect this? Let's say like now you mentioned uh, women change how they dress or like they avoid this and this. So how can we affect this cultural and 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 perception by? By design, yeah, it's uh, it's it's part of a of a of a big problem. Mm. So we're we're aware of that we're going to do our part. Yeah. Someone else should be doing their part, and so on. Yeah. But I think spatial configuration and, and spatial relationships with within cities mm-hmm. is at the very basis of uh, of many of the let's say of the issues we have in cities. Now, it's it's very relevant to. Uh, to, to to be, I mean, the difference between being in a city center or being in the periphery, if you were in Milan, in Paris, the the sensation you have is totally different. And if you think of it, the very essence of this is so much related to the spatial configuration of relationships that were set years ago through planners. Mm. And uh, so, so we think that through planning, there's a there's a lot of uh, corrections and corrective measures that can yeah. be taken. Just think about the the, the coverage of public transportation in the periphery. You know, we've always talked about the big dilemma between coverage and patronage on on a public transportation. Mm. You as a, as a as a as a city, you're not going to make money by by putting too many lines no. in the periphery because you don't have perhaps as much demand as you have in a typical city center. Still, you would do that because you're going to generate another benefit, which is mm. indirect. And and I think this this in a way is going to be the way of thinking on a on a planning level. When you give land use mix, so let's say when you give um, permits to, to to build huge developments in the in in anywhere in the city, today the one once the screening was done, just using specific parameters. Yeah. But we introduced the parameter of mixity and understanding the benefits of 
of having those uh, mixed use developments or uh, looking at how much we're activating ground floor, how dead is ground floor after 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 working hours or or in nighttime. I think these components were overlooked in the past mm. and they should be part of the discussions. So at least if we do that small change, we have, we believe that on the long run, something can start influencing the, the that level of security and that sense of 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 safety within those places so mm. so this is this is how we are facing so far in in terms of design materials i think it's um if you think of any labyrinthical subway station in paris no mm. and you think about any modern open uh train station somewhere anywhere mm, mm. <laughs> new ones no yeah. you can feel that the the way we configure space even within even inside a building and how complex it is to reach one place to another and where are those points where it might be less a bit more in the blind spot within an overall uh, configuration i think mm. these things are, are are very important and and if when we talk about design then we're talking about everything we're talking about also cleanliness of the space mm. the, the level of lighting the the the, the resting areas do you have or not it's just because if you have resting areas and you give the opportunity for someone to sit there mm. that's one will give you a sense of safety as well yeah. if everything is just about movement and movement then you might uh, lose that sense of so just i'm giving examples of how design can can impact whether yeah. it's configuration whether in furniture mm. whether in lighting, material and colors so all of these we think are going to feed but this part of the story is not really something we're mainly focusing on in this project mm. but i mean like these might sound like kind of obvious elements that we should have public spaces like so why we end up in uh, that cities are like how to say um not being successful in serving women and making them have a good experience i mean is it because what we learn in schools is not really working? Is it because like, w why we end up like this? Yeah, well, it starts from the, the big struggle. I mean, the big, uh, uh, I mean, it starts from the intrinsic uh, nature of, uh, of of us human beings from being women, uh, men, and this is a long story. I think on on our side, why why this is happening, really, we're looking, we're looking into this and that's why we're, we're trying for the mm. first time to look at this synoptically now because it's very easy to stories are nice but it's all very easy to fall into them now yeah and and to get to conclusions very very early i think that the magic of of data in this case and mm. that's why we are opening an investigation about this which is the project we're doing otherwise it could have been done just in a couple of interviews and you say you know what streets <laughs> are not safe because lighting levels are low yeah, no? yeah. Or because uh because you, you should avoid having bars and, and men would be at the bars and so on. No? But I think this time we're trying to look at this synoptically as a as a phenomenon, as, as a phenomenon that happens on, on a city scale. Mm. So uh, so this is this is really what we're looking into. We're looking into uh, um, into the, the entire city. We're trying to instead of reaching conclusions, we try to like to rank the city in a way. Uh. We to start to understand which is ranking better on that specific scale so which is ranking better on on the scale of the proximity to public transportation which is ranking better in terms of services now if you have the services or you don't have the services how much do you need to walk to get to the services mm. if you got the service three, three minutes away from your home it's different from someone who's going to walk for 20 25 minutes yeah. to get them yeah. especially if they don't have the possibility to uh, to have public transportation, mm. and that they don't uh, they don't afford that, they, or they don't want to spend that money for that specific uh, journey. So when we when we start talking about this, I think it is a way to start doing this multiple ranking, mm. and then and then looking at the whole picture together, yeah. coming to those heat maps and say, okay, something is happening there. Mm, exactly. This, this. Yeah. So so again, we're very cautious about. The limits and the technical mm. capabilities that our study can do. So, not yeah. promising this we're going to solve the problem, but we're going to take a small step within this mm -hmm. huge amount of research that's being carried out. Mm -hmm. And 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 we know that this is this is something. If you look back 20, 30 years ago, this was not really looked at as something mainly 
designer's role. Mm -hmm. We thought, that, I wouldn't say that, I mean, in a very uh, convinced way. I, I'm sure that even hundreds of years ago, someone has, yeah. has had, but there wasn't enough effort and the mm -hmm. momentum that was building into the research yeah. world, which starts from awareness on gender in general, which our new generations are much aware compared mm -hmm. to previous ones. It's all building momentum to to push this improvement, so to speak, on every level. And we're doing a small step. Yeah. And with the, this huge amount of data, are you getting help from AI to analyze it somehow? Or how do you analyze it? Uh, no, we have uh, data analysts in-house. Yeah. And that's the strength of Systematica. We've been doing this with big companies in the mm. past. We've worked with uh, transportation companies in the US and in Europe and in, with institutes. So analyzing the data is not really the, um, the I mean, it's something we are, we're covering uh, in-house. We're trying as much as possible also to use the cutting edge technologies of today mm. to get that data. And especially when the data is, is when you, when you take, when you let's take an example of uh, getting data that is being renewed every mm. week, yeah. every month. I think looking at the trend also is, is an interesting one. And uh, yeah, so so this is what we are mm -hmm. mainly focusing on. Yeah, and from all the stories and data and so on, observations, where is the or what is the role of the car? I know you're you're exploring the walkability, but how much car is existing and powerful in this story? Yeah, well, so far the car is out of this uh, okay. equation. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> It's, an, it's a good point, actually, because there's a lot of harassment also happening in cars, you know, especially if you yeah. think about, uh, I, I wouldn't think, that, I wouldn't say that this is something we have evidence for in Europe, mm. but you know that also car is a place which has been also debated. This is more applicant to, applicable to, to, the, to GCC, to the Arab world, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where, for instance, take the case of Saudi Arabia. Uh, women are driving today and this whole thing is very new so there is some some prejudice in terms of of uh, of harassing so just uh, take an example of uh, of bumping against a man if you're driving a woman on your own you'd be insulted for sure mm. because because based on the prejudice of years but i think this whole thing is is at the very beginning of getting much better and getting into the mindset so, so that's why well, talking about Milan, the car was put aside and also the car in terms of, if you think in terms of the total number of movements per day, mm. the car is not taking a very important share. Mm. And the municipality is also working to make the car less and less as an option. Mm. But in order to make the car less and less as an option, yeah. we need to make sure that our alternative options are really valid. Mm. And so like walkability, public transportation, even taking a scooter, even, even taking, uh, taking a bike. In the Diamond Project in the past, we focused on bike sharing, mm. we focused on stations. So we tried to look at the different facets yeah. of transportation. And the, the only thing we looked at in cars when it came to cars was autonomous cars, mm. because there was also a research that we carried out with a Spanish company uh, regarding the sensation or the perception of a car, because, you know, the car still is perceived by men very yeah. much differently by, compared to women. So the focus was not really about the movement of cars, but about your relationship mm. inside the car to yeah. your car and that type of feedback would have been much more useful to car manufacturers who would be doing the cars of tomorrow mm. of how to make also that fair uh, approach to to designing cars uh and especially if cars are going to be autonomous in the future so yeah so again cars are out of the equation here yeah. it's not out of the, of the equation in general no. and diamond is a good project is a good yeah. example of it. yeah but also like um, during COVID, there was like a big boost of uh, different transport mode, like biking, also the electrical bike and uh, what do you call it? Electrical, electrical scooter, right? Yeah, exactly. In, yeah. Mi in Milan at least, yeah. Yeah, Milano was, was a huge test bed to, to test all those new, uh, new ways. Well, the advantage in that, in that moment is that there were no movements and... Uh, yeah. And we knew that uh, public transportation was going to be the first to suffer mm. out of uh, COVID because no one wants to get in proximity to another. And getting an individual but fast mode of transportation mm. 
in a city like Milan, which is not so big, you have the total diameter of, let's say, the first circuit is around five, six kilometers. Mm-hmm. So it's really a small, uh, small city. It's yeah. perfectly flat. You can you can cycle anywhere. Yeah. There are a few ups and downs which are artificial within in, inside the city. Yeah. So it was a very good uh, test bed to mm-hmm. uh, to to do those types of interventions. Yeah. yeah. So so. So in that sense, making sure that this mode of transportation is good for both women and men is is key. Yeah. And uh, so to close up the story of this project, uh, when is it going to be published, like the final um, reports and so on? Uh, we should be done by uh, March, April 2024. Yeah. 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 So we started early uh, this year, late, late uh yeah, early spring, late winter, we, we kicked off. And uh, yeah, now we are done with our literature reviews. Where our questionnaires are ready. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the, the data we're collecting from the municipality of Milan, which has been very helpful, has been very effective. So mm. today we're getting um, in touch with more and more sectors and subsectors to get yeah. all types of information. Many of the information is really um, something we're getting for the first time. Mm. It's not, it's not easy to get those data without having a research umbrella. And when it is Fondazione Cariplo that is funding this, I think the appetite of public administration to be part of such a project mm-hmm. is is much bigger. So uh, so today we're there. We're I wouldn't say not even halfway through. We are one third of of process, and we're still in but but so far so far so good we're very yeah. uh, optimistic about this project great and and uh, so far what should urban planners and designers stop doing when we plan and design city from this perspective walkability for women yeah well first of all we need to to plan for walkability we need to plan for for spaces that are well connected that are done uh, at human scale I think this is one, one important point because we, we we're seeing new cities today that are still being designed for cars. They are still designed for long distances. They are still not dense enough to make it them efficient, sustainable. So the first thing is really to to go back hundreds of years back and look mm-hmm. at how cities were done, not to be stuck in the past, but because the simplicity of the past and the and the technology that was not there. In a way, it took us in a more into, 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 you know, into a natural path. Yeah. Now, technology that we have can be uh, can be a double sided weapon. It's very great and it's good because it takes us from one place to another very quickly. At the same time, that 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 how say call it that that speed with, with, in which it takes us tends to elongate our cities mm. to make mm. them bigger. Look at Dubai, it's a 60, 70 kilometer city. You can put something like 10 Milans inside. Mm. You know, not in terms of population. The population is the same. Yeah, but, less. Yeah. Yeah, but that in terms of uh, of um, of land use and mm. the footprint, uh, the, despite the density, still it's very uh, flat. So, uh, so in that sense, we don't want to create the city of islands. Yeah. We want to create a city that works as a city. So the, the much the bigger it becomes, it should can maintain some sort of the same logic. And I think this is really in, in simple terms the first thing I think we as planners should be aware of. And knowing that cities are not done from scratch, we mm-hmm. need to know how to retrofit, how to to bring lessons uh, into into new areas and new developments without losing some of the key principles. Yeah. And. Um... Is there a specific skills or skill that we should learn or develop? I think the 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 most important thing is to make use of the information we have today and transform that into knowledge. Uh, what I mean is that today we have a huge amount of information and data mm. that is coming from the city. This is something we did not have in the past. So we have to learn how to how to first of all tame this big data it's a big data it's a big monster no it, mm-hmm. you can you have a, a, millions of information you can get every single moment in a big city like like uh, new york paris mm-hmm. madrid um if you don't know how to tame the data which what i mean with tame is that the, the data can be too vast 
you need to be very selective in the way you look at that data. So you have mm. to process the data. You have to, to make sure that you're not getting to any conclusions so early or you're not processing the data in a way that it's going to be misleading you. So I think this knowledge, it's it's becoming a must. So it's not, so the science of cities is becoming more and more complex. Mm. It's not enough anymore to have the vision. Osman today would have some difficulties, no? <laughs> The, the urban planner being the, the the let's say the cutting knife of the politician should not be the way mm. anymore. Today we have enough data to justify our actions, and we have enough real time data to correct our actions as we as we do our our daily work. Mm. So I think today the planner's role is much more sophisticated than years ago, because of the simple fact that it's not a single single uh, let's say uh, single man mm, let's use the mm. title of the word man because the urban planners of the past were men yeah you have to admit so that the, we need to avoid this uh, single brain taking mm. big decisions on behalf of millions of people so it should be much more uh much more uh, bottom up it should be uh, much more into engaging people the city is for everyone so i think this is the, the right the right approach it sounds it sounds sometimes theoretical it sounds tough to to make and to realize, but I think we have to really insist on that and transform that mechanism into tools. Yeah. And those tools would be something that you have to learn before practicing your urban mm -hmm. planning. So like the re reading and analyzing the data, this is the skill that should, we should uh, develop. Yeah. This is this is number one for sure. Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah, we have to be more sensitive to to items that were not in in textbooks of 30 years ago. Mm. We have to reinvent a bit the textbooks. We have to reinvent manuals. We have to reinvent what is called the design standard. Oh. So yeah, so we have to we have to challenge all of these because uh, because things are changing yeah. faster, much yeah. faster. Yeah. And I think COVID also taught us something that it's not only good to, uh, uh, I mean, you can, you need to be fast. You need to yeah. act fast. Things can change much faster than you can imagine. Mm. Uh, you might need to adapt. Uh, when we talk about resilience, it's all about adaptation. Mm. It's it's really uh, the, the the urban planner's role today is not just to to forecast trends and growth. Mm. It can be disrupted anywhere, anytime. Can we design for this? Not really. But can we really mitigate it and know how to mm. to face it in the best way? This is the toolkit that we need to work on today. Yeah. But it's a very interesting project, and uh, and I'm happy that people like you and the teams are doing it, and really looking forward to, uh, when you finish it. So maybe we also like follow up uh, the projects, and I wish you all the good luck also. And uh, now we are we are moving to the second part of this episode, and it's about you, uh, because okay. in the podcast we explore like uh, cities for people, but also then the people behind cities for people. So. Tell me, what are your challenges being part of this multidisciplinary project, research project, as a Rawad? Yeah. Well, my, my biggest challenge, and I think what keeps me motivated today, is uh, is trying to keep together a nice group of uh, thinkers, of people that are putting brain cells into into something. It's, mm. it's really about uh, trying to to read into people's minds, get the potentials, not stop any new idea from, from popping up. Mm. And at the same time, making sure that your the people working with you are going to be sustained economically. Uh, so, so this is this is just in very pragmatic uh, terms, mm. the big challenge, you know, because we are not a research institute that is part of a bigger institute of a, or, or of a, a governmental body, which in a way, uh, still they have their own problems for sure, but we are private single operators that yeah. are doing their economy on their own. We're, mm. we're, we're navigating in a market, which is good at times, bad at times. So all of this, reconciling this together with your research dreams and endeavors and looking at all the, the brilliant uh, young people who are starting their profession and they are full of energy, how to transform that energy into something that can be really 
that turn into legacy for future generations, I think is the biggest uh, is the biggest challenge in a way, in, in very theoretical terms. Yeah. But what is the secret of keeping a good relationship with different uh, people? Because like every project, maybe you have different teams and you need to have a good relationship in order to keep the team running. So what, yeah. what is your secret? <laughs> well, no secret. I think uh, I think it's really about observation. Mm. It's really about listening and observing and trying to uh, trying to make sure that everyone working within a specific group is maintaining uh, maintaining a personal agenda and a team agenda. Yeah. It's very important to cultivate personal interests and to make sure that everyone is motivated because there's there's a part of him or her into that project. Mm. Now, I, I think we're all, in a way, we're, <laughs> we, 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 yeah, in a way we're, I, I don't I don't think we are um, egocentric, but we're, in a way we're self-referential because the, the, the balance, that, the overall balance you do at the end of the day is between you and yourself. Mm. Now, so you have to say, what is my path? What am I doing? Yeah. Am I doing something nice? I mean, I'm doing what I really like. So it's really about uh, making sure that you're, you're you're steering that personal interest into something which might be good for the whole team mm. and is good for a project. So I think I think this is, if you want, the 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 secret, which is uh, which is it's a it's a pseudo laissez faire in terms of approach. No, it's not do whatever you want. I love anarchy, but at some point you have to put it together. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think trying to find this and making the team motivated is the way you can win any obstacle. Yeah. And what yeah. motivates uh, Rawad? Well, what what motivates me is really the motivation of everyone else, and trying also to go back to my own uh, agenda mm. and look at it at uh, look at the big picture. No? okay. Uh, this is something you won't do every day, but once every 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 now and then you would say, okay, what are we doing? And you start thinking about, okay, well, we worked on this project, we worked on that project. Mm. I I met that person. I I challenged that. I opposed this. I I expressed my opinion. And then you look at it uh, comprehensively. You think that on a professional level, you're not stagnant. You're just doing something. And I think this is. My my uh, my personal uh, my personal uh, satisfaction, but as a team, I think the more I dissolve, the more I'm invisible within the team, the stronger the team is. Mm. Because you know, it's very easy to to be opting to be a star. I'm totally the opposite. All I want is to really to disappear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we we're just joking the other day with a client, and he said, uh, "Oh, you're right. You're you're the star." I said, "No, I would like to be the moon." <laughs> This is the approach. Sometimes yeah. you have to disappear, especially if you're leaving yeah. a company, because you have to lead at the same time, you don't have to be in the lead. Mm. So um, so I think it's a delicate uh, it's a delicate balance that you have to maintain, otherwise the team won't grow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, name name one thing you did uh, you and you're very proud of. And then one thing you did, and you're not really, how to say, a kind of regret, or if you go back in time, you will not do it. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, um, something I'm proud of, uh, do you want me to talk about a single project or you, in general? You are, as you decide, it's up to you. Okay, okay. No, look, uh, I have a few projects I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mention many of them, but I think those projects with, in which I was very proud of are those projects where we did a lot of work with uh, with decision makers, with mm -hmm. public administrations, uh, where we uh, came into those offices in a very bold manner. And we we gave our standpoint. No, uh, when we think outside of the box, and you're asked to do something, but you all all of a sudden you do ten things. I think it is a moment where where you're really uh, happy. Let me just mention one experience yeah. I had. I was managing, I was directing the the project, which is called uh, the the national the master plan for Gaza and West Bank, mm. and uh, mo doing modeling. Typically, you model in normal conditions. No, you model. 
I mean, the, the concept of, uh, of of checkpoints doesn't exist in a, in a traffic model, no? No. Because it doesn't exist in normal life. And when you work amidst uncertainties and in a place where where things might be slightly different, you you tweak your instruments to recreate that situation, which mm. is up, so to speak. And then once you have that, you bring it back to normality and you compare both of them. And you understand that very much, very often, just by doing nothing, you can get a huge benefit just by turning in a situation from abnormal to normal. And, and you measure it. And actually, we, we published a, uh, a small article called, uh, well, I remember the name, but the essence was the, that what is the cost of peace? No, what uh, is the cost of doing nothing, of turning things into normal? Yeah. There's a huge cost. So today, when we look at the world and the, all the wars we're looking mm. at, and we are being uh, taken right and left by big, mm. by, by, by single persons, by... Yeah. Uh, it all of a sudden becomes very interesting, you as a scientist, to jump into this for the first time in history, where you're not trying to make one political party happier than the other, mm. but just trying to give objective findings saying, look what you've done, look what would have would happen just by simply not doing what you're doing, not mm. by doing something else, but just by doing nothing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this was uh, mo one project I was very proud of, but in terms of being also proud of, uh, in general, I think uh, we're, I'm very proud of being part of uh, Transform Transport and Systematica and yeah. uh, and of how the team is growing. We've been growing uh, in an interesting way. So today we are working with around 75 collaborators. In, wow. In, yeah. So wow. we are, yeah. So I mean, when I, when I joined the Systematica, we were much less, it was times of crisis. Yeah. It was 2008 and uh, the, the, the world was, was suffering. So we had to be uh, very uh, perseverant. We yeah. had to work hard. We had to really believe in what we were doing. Mm. And I think one of the things I'm proud of is the the, the big, uh, the, the nice team we're having. And uh, whenever you see someone going and giving a lecture there, or someone mm. working in, at university, and you, you just feel that it's a it's a nice ecosystem. It's uh, something that we are we have always uh, dreamt of of having a nice team. We don't have uh, we again no no stardom. We're not looking to be on the on the cover page. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking just to be uh, at the forefront of research projects and yeah. Uh, consultancy. Yeah. yeah. So these are the things you're proud of. Yeah. And tell me about something you <laughs> you will not do again if you go back in time or regret. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I've, I've read that uh, question <laughs> and I have no answer. <laughs> no answer? Uh, look, I'm, uh, I'm I'm not a regret person. I tend to deny regret. No, so uh, this is this is one of the the instruments I use personally. But I know that there are lots of things that I've done that I wouldn't uh, do. But I'm more on the microscopic level. No, they're more into daily relationships. Mm. Sometimes. You say one thing and it's a big mistake and it takes you a year hmm. to, to to correct it. Really, yeah. it's about, I mean, let's let's say let's talk about temper in a, in a big company. You, you might you might lose your temper at some point. But you learn by time that that temper is an enemy, and in a way, hmm. it's enough to say a single word and you just don't know how to redo undo that. And it takes years. So yeah. I think it's uh, the, the big regrets are much more on a on a microscopic level. Mm. It's about uh, daily life, how to deal with the, the, the with the ordinary daily everyday practice. Uh, yeah, but I wouldn't say in terms of big moves, I've been I mean, I've been pretty consistent. I mm. I, I started somewhere st studying. I started in Lebanon. I um, I worked a bit in the in New York, and then I moved back. And then I decided to move to Italy. So all those steps so far, I don't regret any of them. I just feel that every time I'm moving from one place to another, yeah. I'm reconnecting the dots and I'm reconnecting the, the different places. So uh, uh, so yeah, on, on big moves professionally, I would say no regrets. It's just in sometimes the, uh, this is something hard to, to, uh, to translate, but in Italian, there's a nice saying, 
which says that uh, that experience is the sum of all your all your mistakes. Mm. Now, and I think this is really uh, about what I I like is that every day you you do a mistake, and you say, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I could have done this. I should have." I should have stayed silent. I yeah, should have yeah. said that. No, so I think it's uh, it's all about this. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, a beautiful reflection. And professionally, if you uh, want to choose another career path or profession, what would you like to do, if not what you're doing now? Musician. Music? Oh, nice, nice. Oh. Well, I have it, actually. No, no, it's... Uh... I, I'm uh, yeah my uh, it's it's not a hobby it's one of my basic passions now yeah. even before action and urban planning uh, yeah but when I learned that uh, that most of the Pink Floyd uh, singers are architects I decided to do to go for architects. <laughs> you still uh, do some of it now or no? Yeah yeah absolutely uh -huh. no no I, I do I'm uh, I'm uh, I started uh, drumming. And uh, then I moved into jazz drumming. Yeah. Then I, uh, I've been practicing oud for uh, for the past twenty five years. Wow. As, as a passion, I'm not a professional, so if I play in front of my real yeah. good professional <laughs> friends, they would say, "Right, oh, <laughs> <not instrument." laughs> but, but I think it's uh, it's it's uh, therapeutic in a way. It heals you at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, it touches your soul. In moments when uh, when your professional career is not able to do that, mm. it's very important when you're a professional musician. Uh, you the music doesn't heal you anymore. You you need to you need something else. So it's not about music. It's just about doing that, which is something which I don't do every day. But yeah, yeah. That uh, that hobby is uh, is my companion for mm. sure. Yeah. yeah. And Rawat, if you uh, want to choose to be something else than being Rawat the human. Like you can be a creature, object, anything, but not the human. What will you choose to be? <laughs> Maybe an oak tree can be good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because of. Well, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it stays in one place. It's uh, it's just consistent. There are lots of visitors, insects, animals, and it grows. Can go all the way till 300, about 300 years, 400 years. Yeah. Even yeah. more. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, this would be a good option. But are you are you tired of moving from different to different cities? Uh, yeah. No. No. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm I'm not planning to move anymore mm. unless. Uh, yeah. Again, it is because of systematic and transport. Yeah. It is because uh, family ties. It's because of. Uh, I think also I found I I lived in a few cities. And I found a nice, um, a nice trade-off and equilibrium in uh, in Milan. Yeah. In Italy, in general, in terms of uh, social relationships, nature. Uh, I mean, every place has defects. No yeah. place is perfect. I'm not looking for perfection. I've lived in places like Beirut, so you can imagine, no perfection at all. <laughs> it's anti-perfection. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely and 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 gorgeous, but uh, uh, livable. Yeah, but not not uh, not close to being called perfect, mm, and not yeah. close to what you're living in Scandinavia. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But but I I I keep moving almost every week. Um, I don't avoid any meeting, even if it's uh, nine hours in plane. Wow. Unfortunately, yes, I'm saying plane because it's we all know it. It's not the best mode of transportation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wouldn't mind. I would spend time flying and traveling just to meet new people and to know new places. Mm. So, so that's something I'm not saving, and I I think that's something I would like to keep doing. I'd like to keep traveling, maybe a bit less than what we used to do before mm. COVID, which mm. was totally crazy. <laughs> Today, it's becoming a bit more reasonable. Yeah. We can meet online. We can, but still meeting people in in mm. in person, uh, fine tuning and. I would say um, refining your 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 human tools as well mm. in in understanding human mind, understanding expectations, and especially when you deal with clients, you you need to understand where they're going, coming from, where they're going mm. to, yeah. and you have to be part of that path. Mm. And professionally, the the only thing that makes you successful is really when you, which when no, it's not when you do what they want. But when you try to steer them in the way mm. that you think that it is much better for them compared to any other path. So, so yeah, traveling is one of the ways to get that. Otherwise, 
you and when you work on projects if you don't look at the context you'll look at the place it's you're going to miss much no yeah. we've known i mean the projects we did during covid i can say they are good nice very well done but they're soulless they yeah are, yeah because you're just... you are not there and experience the soul the reality of that place yeah i mean we worked on uh On, on a big mobility master plan in Barranquilla in Colombia. Mm. I've never been there. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a it's a black spot on my record. Yeah, you know? it's yeah. a, how can you do that? Mm. True. And how do you keep the work life balance? You have a family, foundation, studio, and you mu doing music and much other stuff. Is there a clear line between all of these? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's time management. It's uh, about uh, uh, just the, which which was against uh, my my principles. No, when I was at school, time management was my okay. enemy. No, I had to be creative. I had to think outside the box. If I'm doing something nice, it should go even to 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. and then the other day I'm just so uh, <laughs> so uh, so sleeping. But I think today, uh, you know, also with age, uh, the energy you've got is not the energy you've got before. So you have to, you have to work on an energy saving more than time management. So, so clear cut between things is absolutely a must. Otherwise, you start doing both in a bad manner. Hmm. Um, uh, you have to make sure that your experience should transform into doing the same thing you used to do in much less time because you have the. You have the wisdom to, yeah. to do it faster, Hopefully. or to take the decision faster. But you also have the skill, and and uh, you have to admit your technical incapabilities when it comes to new new uh, technologies. So you have to you have to give mandates. You have to delegate. You do not have to think that you are the the owner and mm. and the savior. You're not the savior. If you disappear, nothing happens. It's all <laughs> <on the floor. laughs> so. If you, If you get that conviction and and uh, and you get away from the the idea that if I don't it I don't do it it's going to be done in the wrong the wrong manner yeah uh, then then uh, then you start uh, not just thinking about how to how to do things right but also what are the right things to do now you're studying more yeah. more selective the time you have to be very much cautious about time and once you do this you mm. are capable of doing everything else but yeah. to admit this I mean it's not that night and that ideal and doesn't work every time so there are some times <laughs> where you have to ask someone to to just you know to, to do some sort of yeah. sacrifice yeah you do it sometimes on behalf of your work sometimes mm. you do it on behalf of your family your friends and uh yeah this is how it works you, you need just to be surrounded by understanding people as well otherwise you're not <laughs> yeah out. yeah <laughs> interesting so uh i'm happy that you reflected with us and uh, now we are in the closing part three questions the f is more about you giving messages so the first one is about you give a message to a student yeah one message yes to a student okay i would say um you can give uh, more if you want <laughs> no, no no because i was uh, i had a nice lecture at the hong kong university and i came up with 10 tips for students. So okay. I'm just to figure one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think for, for a student is um, is is to really uh, question everything. Okay. To question uh, to question all you see in the handbooks, really. But uh, but what I mean with this is we question, but if you want to break the rules, you really have to know the rules first. Okay. No? Mm -hmm. So, so we need to questioning doesn't make doesn't mean that we have to oppose everything. Questioning is okay. Uh, you do it, but uh, you do it because you have to learn how you do it, and and then but you have to question: Can it be done differently? Can it be done better? Mm. So, I think questioning is the secret word, but also knowing the rules very very well before breaking them is very is very good because no one can break the rules better than a student no <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so if you if you break the rules with while but having the the modesty and the patience to understand mm. them so if there's a formula the uh, first thing you have to do is just memorize the formula and then try to find a better solution yeah i think it's a good way also to give respect to 
to to the past, but also not stop there and try to 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 think of something different. Yeah, cool. And uh, next one, three takeaway messages to our listeners. Uh, takeaway in general, or what takeaways? Um, yeah, um, also up to you if you want it's more like urban planning wise or in general, totally up to you. Yeah, I think from what we discussed today, there are a few nice uh, uh, nice takeaways. I think the, um, yeah, well, the first, the one which comes to my mind as last one, I, I would I would focus on, on professional takeaways. The professional takeaways, I think it's really about, again, uh, keep uh, nourishing that curiosity to uh, discover places. And to know about uh, about human mind, mm -hmm. and and which which very often is the decision maker for making places. So, I think in that sense, uh, the first thing is we really not to stop, keep moving, and and try to, uh, yeah, try to know new places. The second takeaway, I would say, I would take it back to research. I think uh, in anything we do, even if we are working on in in whatever domain researching looking at what others are thinking just having the modesty of saying perhaps someone else is doing it better than me let me look at what others do, did mm -hmm. and then instead of copying just taking that absorbing it giving it some time and then trying to to use it as part of your uh, of your practice would be really great i'm not talking about only architecture and urban planning it can be just working at the post office and just mm -hmm. thinking that why am i doing this that way let me let me research a bit, no, and and yeah. you end, uh, and you end up uh, getting new. I think just having the modesty to look at other opinions and to listen is is a huge takeaway. It's something that you can you can use uh, everywhere. Sometimes we we miss we miss this because today with uh, I mean I've seen it even in in video calls. You know, you're 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 on the call, but you're doing something else, yeah, yeah. and and you're not focusing. But at the end of the day, you know what? You're not getting neither neither nor because you're not enjoying the the you're just being tortured because you're part of that talk mm -hmm. and you're just not doing well done this job you're doing so i think we just need to be uh to be also um focused yeah i think i mentioned many takeaways so perhaps <laughs> we can take three of them <laughs> yes yes uh last question of this episode is going to be asked by you so i have no more questions now it's your time to ask me and the listener a question yeah, absolutely. I've been always fascinated by uh, by podcasts in general, you know, because uh, uh, many friends they are so much into podcasts and they keep giving podcasts together. To be honest, I've never watched a podcast, yeah, and it's a bit of uh, podcast allergy. But yesterday, because I'm I'm going to talk to you, <laughs> I talked to you, I, I listened to your podcast, and all of a sudden I managed to listen to a uh, to a few of episodes, and uh, and I was not annoyed. I That's was good. not uh, bored, yeah. No, so it opened a, a world for me because it's so much in line with what I'm saying. Yeah. In terms of listening to what people are mm. thinking, so why don't you tell me a bit more about you as a, if I may call you a podcaster, maybe not. It could be, yeah. <laughs> but just how how do you face your your daily life and and what keeps you, what keeps you moving forward? Yeah, what keeps me moving forward is that uh, I see the impact of, of this podcast. Uh, now we are almost like soon going to be 400 episodes uh, with more than 400 people. And the beauty of this is that like people doing impact on the ground like you, Rawad, being here, sharing their knowledge and experience. And I see the number of listeners, which give me a sign that, okay, people are listening. And then I get a lot of messages that people are reading the links, connecting with the guests and doing projects or like students start to study this specific program. So I see there is an impact and I'm really happy because like I know I can do impact on with my projects as an urban planner here in Stockholm. But at the same time, like I, I'm trying to maximize my pa impact from my passion. And this is a beautiful way. So also I'm grateful for you and the guests that being here and sharing. So this is makes me move forward and keep doing it. And 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 I suggest and I suggest you to uh, take this summer to think about maybe start a podcast. First, listen as how <laughs> as how you tell your students like uh, listen and learn the system and the rules, and then be part of it maybe or challenge it. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's really nice because I'm, uh, I, I, uh, I personally like to uh, to share ideas and like to just yeah. talk to people. So it's, uh, I'm going to listen to a few podcasts. If you have any suggestion apart from yours, yeah, just send it my way. I'll be happy to to take that. On. Yeah, I will. So thank you so much, Rawad, for giving your valuable time to record this episode. Uh, I will be more than happy to follow this up, and I wish you a beautiful summer vacation as well. Thank you very much, Mustafa. It was really nice to get your questions. I'm really happy to that I've talked about professional, but you don't keep it on a professional level. You know what is the importance of personal affairs in professional life. So mm-hmm. I think your your approach is is really good in that sense. I really appreciate, and it's really fun to to reflect on oneself. You never do it. You would, you would never sit in front of a mirror to do that. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mustafa. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Rawat. Take Have care. Bye-bye. Bye.